Okay, so should you invest in Pokemon video games? Suppose the base of this video is a lot of the time we talk about Pokemon collectibles and a lot of these are the trading cards and you know the, the collectibles in that sense. But what I want to focus on in this video is talking about the video games and whether or not how investable they are or are they just something that you add to your collection. So arguably the main reason why people got into Pokemon was because of the video games. I mean, we did have the anime, but a lot of the people where they really made their connection with the franchise was through the video games, you know, um, and it's spanning so many different generations. So it's a real interesting topic because I think a lot of people just think of the cards and the trading cards, but they never really look at the video games. But I want to just cover some points regarding that. And not only that, but like as time's gone on, some of the older video games are actually fetching really good prices and really high prices. However, what I really want to talk about is whether or not the video games are a good decision and whether you know you know you should be investing in current video games. The thing with video games is they also have grading as well. So just like cards, how they get graded by PSA, Beckett, CGC, the video games can also get graded by their respective companies, you know, stuff like VGA, WADA, um, CGC also grade video games. So, you know, this also brings a little bit of a debate because people do argue it's a little bit of a highly debated topic because people think, oh, video games, why are you grading video games? Because Suppose when you look at cards, they, their purpose is purely collecting or playing when you're using them. But there's a big collecting aspect to cards and there's always has been. When you look at video games, I guess their main purpose is to actually play the game. Their use is to be, you know, it's an entertainment form. So the collecting aspect for video games really comes after the fact. It's not a, it's not its predominant focus point. Its focal point is entertainment. When we look, and I want to use actually some data point examples for this. And when I talk about percentage growth over the time, so I want to really try to give a accurate representation of this. Pokemon Black and White are a really good place to start because their video games have actually gone up quite a bit in value than Nintendo DS games. So I want to just use those as the base points for today's topic. So I'm on eBay and I've just gone on recently sold. So this is all US as well. I'm on the US eBay as well. So these are all US prices, right? So I'm on here on eBay and I can see that the Nintendo DS Pokemon Black version 2 closed in box with manual and inserts tested and working just recently sold for $175. One bit on that. And I can see here that the game here, just a loose copy, no booklet, no nothing, just sold for 120 US. Quite a decent price. So that 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 from you know what games retail for, that's definitely up. So that's you know gone, you know, I think that's even played as well. So that's a played copy. It's not even we're not even talking about a sealed copy. It's gone up quite a bit in value. That that's that's you've already enjoyed the entertainment, you've just held on to it. You know, that's a fair bit of a rise. Going over here though, when we look at it in a grader, now I couldn't find any versions of Pokemon Black two graded, but I did find Pokemon White version two graded. So this is a water grade of a 9.6 factory sealed mint. This just sold recently for 600 US. So that's a pretty big, that's a pretty decent jump. If you sent this to grade and you had it closed in box and you never played it and you just immediately got your game graded, you know, got a 9.6 and, you know, held onto it, that's a significant sale price. Um, so, so you can see that the games have actually gone up quite a bit in their percentage growth. But what we're really wanting to compare it to is when you compare it to the trading card. So right now I'm moving on here. So I'm now going also in the black and white era, which is Pokemon Dark Explorers booster boxes. And you can see, I'm just going on, when we look at Dark Explorers booster box, we can see on 47 bids, that in 2012 factory sealed black and white Dark Explorers booster box with 36 packs sold for 4,000 US. So the price entry point of this would have been at around 110, 110 US for the booster box. And that's gone up an enormous amount in value. So you can see when you compare it, it's not that investing in the black and white was a bad decision, but the percentage growth of the booster boxes is completely different. Uh, same thing when we just even look at the loose pack, right? So here's a loose pack of Dark Explorers, factory sealed, one bid $128. I mean, I'm not sure what they were selling for in, in 2012, how much loose packs were selling for. My guess is around three to four US. Someone can maybe confirm that, that, that just, just gone off instinct, but that's a huge amount of percentage growth as well. So you can see that it's gone up as well. The only difference is when we look at this in particular is that the Pokemon Black 2, Black White, actually sometimes you can even play completely enjoy the entertainment and sell it for a pretty, you know, pretty big profit as well. So, you know, not many people are just going to be holding onto their video games completely sealed in closed in box. Same thing when we go into the Pokemon Blue era, right? So I'm just going here and I'm going into, I'm using Pokemon Blue as an example and, and I want to use those eras 
to kind of illustrate the, the point here. So here we go, we got Pokemon Blue recently sold. So you can see a loose copy of Pokemon Blue um, with the battery working sold for 60 US. But you know, if we go down and you can see a closed in box tested and authentic, you can see that this one sold for 400. So if you kept the box and the manual and everything's working, you can see that it actually has gone up um, also a, a pretty you know decent amount. The real key here, and where I wanna go is when you compare these eras. Now, what happens if we had a graded copy of this version, right? So this gets a little bit more interesting. You can see the water version of a 9.2 just sold 21 bids for 5,200 US. Now that's a pretty significant rise. So that is quite an enormous amount for the graded copy. You can see now that the actual, when once it's graded, you know, closed in box, it's got a good grade. This one's actually gone, you know, a fair bit in value. But the problem is as well, just like when you compare older booster boxes, how many people are holding on to sealed copies of games? Now, it could actually be interesting. And one thing that we want to even, oh, I want to actually mention, even now, a lot of people are aware of booster boxes and they keep them sealed and they try to look after it. Are people aware of physical copies and are people storing physical copies? Um, even today, people might think that's, you know, that, that, that's completely out of the realms of common sense. They're not even bothering with that. So that's kind of interesting. I think the same sentiment applies of people keeping sealed copies of video games now. It's probably as unlikely as it was back then. Whereas with sealed, you know, booster boxes and stuff, people are definitely holding onto them. Um, there's much more of an uprise of people actually looking after their sealed collections. But then if you look at the same era and you went for a jungle um, unlimited booster box, so this is a, fo sorry, a fossil unlimited booster box, you can just see recently sold 7,000, 8,000 US. So they're around that seven to 8K mark. And then if you went even to a first edition, you could see a first edition was selling for 20,000 US. So when we look at the percentage growth, they're probably quite similar, but you can see just in that com in comparison, this is the fossil. If you went to an actual base set, 1999, the original, the one that started it all, you know, you're even talking prices way, way bigger than these. So that's a really interesting thing about when investing in these two different um, areas. Other point what I want to talk about, and when you think about investing in the games, there's two different trains of thought with this, right? So when we look at uh, the cards, the cards have no, when you have to think of a purpose whenever a product, and in marketing, we think of the purpose of a product. The reason why trading card collectibles are unique is because the consumer or the person creating the purchasing decision understands the purpose of cards. They're not giving you anything magical. That You know that they're a collectible. You know that they are, they're not gonna, you know, there's nothing in them that's, that's anything spectacular other than the fact that they're collectible. The purpose of cards is either you play them in the trading card game or you collect them, you know? And then when you look at like even the trading card game with Pokemon, they've got a huge collector market, right? When you look at something like Magic and Yu-Gi-Oh, there's a lot of people actually playing the game, the trading card. Pokemon still has that share of the market, but if you actually looked at it on a big scale, I'd, I'd be pretty confident to say that a huge portion of Pokemon, people buying Pokemon products are collectors, right? When you look at video games, the whole purpose of a video game is to play the game. It is a form of entertainment. You are playing the game. So that is the two different thoughts of them. So these are always collectible by nature. Trading cards and stuff are just collectible in the, in the, in the sense. The video games aren't so much like that. You don't really have an alternative for the cards. There, there's nothing you can really do unless you get the card. You can't buy a counterfeit because it doesn't serve the same purpose because the whole point of those cards is to have the legitimate authentic copies. Not only that, but like if you look at something like Pokemon Red, Pokemon Red had Pokemon Fire Red that released in 2004 and you, then you had Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Let's Go Pikachu that released in 2018, right? If you wanted to actually play Pokemon Red, you could argue that playing Fire Red or Let's Go is better than playing the 1996 version. Like you're gonna actually probably have a more enjoyable time. So people may not even be that compelled to go and play and they don't need to pay that money to actually play that game from 1996. The other thing is, is print runs, right? Pokemon trading cards have a limited amount that they're printed. It's quite known that they're printed just for a small segment of time. Once the print run's done, they move on next. They have a higher turnover, a quicker, that it moves on quicker. Sets move on much quicker in the trading card games. You know, you have sometimes three, four, even five sets a year. So they're moving on quicker. Whereas with the games, they have a longer shelf life. So even if you look from 2018, let's look at Pokemon Eevee, let's go. You can see they're still available in stores right now. You can still buy them completely brand new in box, no questions asked. Whereas if you wanted to get a booster box from 2018, 
You would not find that in any retailer right now and you'd have to pay enormous prices to get it because it's got a quicker turnaround time. The next phase happens quicker. The chapters for video games take slower. So there's also, and they still make production runs of them as well. So you've got to also think about that when investing. When I'm thinking of Yu-Gi-Oh, there's a good Yu-Gi-Oh game that's a good example of this. When we look at Yu-Gi-Oh Dark Dual Stories on the Game Boy Color. And something really interesting is here, right? I'm looking at the on eBay recently sold. Look at this. The last sold Game Boy is $14.99. So that is when you want just the Game Boy copy of the game, the Game Boy Color cartridge, right? When you get it closed in box graded, check this out. 3,500 US it just recently sold for. The reason why it sells so much is because there's actually three cards inside of this that you get in the closed pack. So if you actually open that right now, you would actually have three copies of some really, really expensive cards inside this. So that's really interesting to know that the only reason this is written so much is because of the trading cards inside it, not because of the video game. The games are real cool collectibles. I think if you're buying the games, even if you're buying sealed games right now and you're just looking after them and you know you wanna open them, you wanna keep them in their plastic, I think that's a really cool collectible. I think Pokemon has such a cool um, influx of people. I think the games are so iconic. They're always, they always a nostalgic attachment for generations. I think they're a cool collectible. In terms of crazy investment, I'm not too sure that they outperform the trading cards. Just looking at the data, I think that there's too many variables in play that will always make the trading cards perform better than the video games in terms of an investment. However, there is one really interesting point I want to make here. And that is the digital versus physical uh, dilemma that's going on right now. The only area where physical sales are still beating digital are in video games. So when you look at CDs, when you look at uh, DVDs or Blu-rays, everything is now digital or streaming. When you look at video games, video games are still, a lot of people still like to get their physical copies. However, this is slowly changing. Even me, I'm a massive collector. I am such a big collector. But even with my, my daughter, my, she's five years old with her Nintendo Switch. Even I have this thought like, geez, it would be so much easier to just go full digital with her Nintendo Switch. Because if we travel, if we go somewhere, um, all, her, her, all her games are in the one spot. She doesn't have to go and take out her physical cartridges and swap them out. If she lost something or, or something happened, she would have everything linked to a Nintendo account. She could just, you know, get a Nintendo Switch again one day, re-download everything. So even me as like a father, for a practical sense, I go, geez, as much as I love collecting physical, when I think of it for like a kid or for like my daughter as a father, I think, geez, it's actually much easier and practical to go digital with her. But this could leave a unique gap and a unique hole in the market because a lot of people might share this sentiment. So as time goes on and more people keep buying, phys uh, uh, sorry, and more people keep buying digital, 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 you might have these Pokemon products that everyone went digital and the fact to even have physicals gets rarer, rarer and rarer and then they become collectible. So that is something that could happen. So could physical copies end up being more than they are now? You know, back then with all these, there was never a digital era. So a lot of these games that you're seeing now, Black and White 2 or, you know, Pokemon uh, Yellow, Pokemon Red, they didn't have digital counterparts. So there was a lot out there. You know, Sword and Shield sold 26 million copies. How many are physical? How many are digital, right? So the, the, the amount of product that's out there might even be smaller than that. We don't know. So it's an interesting thing to think of. So yes, the games are great collectibles. In terms of an investment, they probably won't outperform the trading cards as of now. But of course, everything can change. Nothing is set in stone. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed that video. Uh, if you did and you really enjoyed it, I would love to have you on the channel. Feel free to like, subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you in another few videos. Thanks guys, enjoy your day, peace.